D&Ders, RPGers, Game Masters and such, I'm going to actually start off by talking about a comment on a video I had about OSR compatibility, basic fantasy role-playing game, a white box, how to make an easy conversion. Uh, one of the people observing this, and his name is, I think, DM Ray. I found out. I'm thinking I pinned him to the top. Retro DM Ray. I don't know if anybody else has this, but the audio skips constantly throughout. And what's weird is I don't remember it being that way when I put it up, but I guess it's doing it now. So I went ahead and started looking at it, and I said a bunch of the things I did in this video has actually changed quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of redo this. So if you've seen it the first time, that's interesting, but I've made a several changes to actually make it better. So to start off with, a lot of it's the same. It talks about how to take White Box, which is my preferred game of play, right? Um, and use ba basic fantasy, right? And I give a big overview about what, let's say, Tales from the Laughing Dragon can be used. Uh, it's, it's, it's for what you pay $3.80 for the paperback book. It's totally worthwhile. 32 page modules, seven maps. I list them here, NPCs. Uh, some guys in the inn and all these things are going down. So if you want something that's really, really easy for cheap, that you, it's a physical copy. Some people don't like using PDFs or don't want to print them all out and burn out your printer. Th these are nice. Get them right on Amazon. It's way to go, right? So I have several of them. So the adventure is for four or six players, and it has three adventures in it. One for the search of the missing gnome, Fonkin, and then the hunt for Valanuth. And last one's Rotom Must Keep. Now, I'm going to say we started this thing with uh, one character. Mike was playing one character. It was a 7th level ranger. And he was going in, and I promised halfway through you'll pop up to 8th. Okay? And so we were playing it, and this is Chuck Berichuk, actually got in touch with us partway through. And so then we took on another character. He made an assassin class. He wanted to give it a try. And sure enough, we had fun with it. But this was what we do. We have, um, I have... Um, Microsoft, not Microsoft Word, I mean Google Sheets, where I do the character sheets so Mike can make adjustments as we're doing it fairly easy. I can see what he's doing. And we, they're just saved like that. This, we started doing this a while ago. And then he has all his stuff on the next thing. These are just basically slides. So he's a seventh level guy. He gets um, a bunch of his stuff as he's going through. And he actually gets some spells as a, a ranger. Now, I think we took the ranger from... James Spawn's Omnibus. So I'm going to scroll back up. White Box Omnibus has the Ranger class. It's not really in this one. So it's kind of cool this was added on. So he wanted to be a Ranger. I said, cool, let's do it, right? So it's kind of how we ran this thing. And um, there's a great video. If you want to go back and check it, look at my thing. Uh, <laughs> Chuck got in there. He was an assassin. Mike was an assassin. They ended up down into the crypt area. And sure enough, they ran into a vampire and... They were persistent until level drain. <laughs> level drain actually supposed to happen two levels per hit. And what happened was, sure enough, uh, they got killed. And it was hysterical. So if you want to go back and watch a funny thing with some like uh, text overlays of what happened, you can go ahead and find this video. It's in one of my things. And I talk about the whole incident, right? So they made a return voyage. And I'll show you what this looks like. This is actually a tracker I made up to keep track. I, I kind of set thing up a little bit different. Um, and if you go back and see the videos, like they would roll a, a dice, like a 10 sided dice. And, and this is, you would run into a random encounter when they went, oh, that's free. Nothing happened here, right? And then um, what they can do is also, uh, they roll another one, let's say roll six. All of a sudden, boom, they ran into a bunch of guys. I number things and I, I draw on this as we go. It makes it much easier for gameplay. So I, I have a different way of doing things. And once again, it's pretty easy. So they took two different other characters. Once was Lawrence, right? Mike picked a seventh level paladin because they found <laughs> out it's kind of hard to fight a vampire if you don't have uh, you don't have that good stuff on your side, the mojo. And uh, I think Chuck picked somebody named Uther, right? A cleric of Palor. He was this guy, and they they went through. They were successful. A lot of fun. They still got beat up pretty bad. I get give them that much, right? So we went through. This is another thing we did. I have a tracker I came up with that I can track their arrows being fired. And when I go to, I show them the screen. So when I fire, they see my dice rolls happening and how much damage they're taking. But that's just me. I make this stuff up because I find it um, 
something I like to do for the hobby when I'm playing online. I like to record these things, right? Everyone's different when they do these things, but this is what I like to do as opposed to roll 20 or something. Um, let's go back and take a look at this. So a couple of the house rules we used, and this is the this is the meat of this discussion. So I'm just kind of sending the police. And I'm using D6, and the reasons are why. Weapon damage is faster for all calculations. You don't have to try to find a D4 or D8 or D10. Or it's just faster. Boom, right? Crits and fumbles make the whole thing interesting. I have a crit and fumble chart I'm going to show you. And thief skills. They can all do some sort of thief skills, thief skills but it's a 1 on a D6. So if they had to do something, they could try to swing it. If they roll um, essentially a 1 out of a D6. Or you could flip that and make it a 6 out of D6, depending on what you like to do. And... The skill checks are very quick with resolve, and I'll show you a couple methods you can use. Uh, D6 roll up, or I can use a D20 roll down, whatever you like. I, I moved into more like the uh, rolling up on the D6 because it's easier, and I'll explain why uh, in the, the, the images coming up, right? So let's talk about melee damage. I found this somewhere. I kind of liked it. Um, so instead of like having a whole bunch of bonuses, I'd say it's like 1d6 if it's one-handed. If it's two-handed, it's 2d6, but you take the higher of the two. And if it's um, a light weapon, it's 2d6 and you take the lowest. It makes it a little easier, and sometimes they can come up with two sixes. They were just lucky that time if it was a, a light weapon. And so it, it kind of increases their odds of actually getting something they want. So a crossbow was like, why would everybody pick a crossbow besides the distance? And I say it's 3d6 take the highest, but you get a bonus to hit a plus two because you could sit there and aim it like a rifle, right? But the firing rate's much slower than a bow, but chances are you're going to hit it, right? So these are things I found like online maybe. I don't know exactly where I got some of this information, to be honest with you, but this is what I've been using. It makes it easier. But most of my players like to use a bow because it's 2d6 take the highest and you get to fire twice. So the time it takes to shoot one crossbow, you can shoot four times. But you go through some arrows, right? Going through some arrows, the problem with that is then you can run out of ammo, right? So that's something to think about, right? And actually, then the last one, you have the lighter versions of things. The short bow, a sling, if you're using a dagger, a light crossbow, or improvised weapon, it's 2d6, take the lowest, all right? So then I do use a 1d6 crit, critical hit and fumble chart, okay? Now I'm going to put... In my description down, a link to this thing. So you can grab these images, I think, and save them or take shots of them or whatever, screenshots. If you want to use them in your game, that's fine too. But the idea behind it is, once again, it's, it, it adds a little flavor when you hit the 20 or you hit the uh, hit the 1. It makes it a little more fun for things that are going on. So as you can sit there and read this thing, it's a variety of things can happen. Hitting your ally, dropping and breaking your weapon or something like that. So it's not just the same thing over and over. Uh so this was my old thief skills at a roll of D6. Now, I don't really have a thief in the adventure we were playing, but I've had them in many adventures. And I used to always say you roll down. And I don't know why that messes players up so much. So I've kind of modified this. And I also made the thief skills limited eight because I'm playing a very, very high adventure module, 15th level, med and, and this is Cyclopean Deeps. And what happened was... Brent didn't have to roll for any skills. And I just kind of said, well, this is what's even the point of having them. So I modified it that when you get, you're still a chance you can screw it up. That's just what I did. So it still makes it interesting. I guess that's what I want. I just don't want it to be an automatic thing. This has to be a little bit, the dice have to have some point to this, right? And obviously dexterity gets applied to the picking of the pockets or moving silently, which kind of makes sense to me, right? And then uh, Halfling gets a plus one to actually moving silently too. So they're the ones that get a lot of bonus to doing something like this. So the new and approved version basically took the concept and just switched it so you have to roll above, at that number above, using a d6. So to hide in the shadows, you have a two and six chance. So these two, these two tables go together, two and six chance. So it's a five or a six on a six-sided dice. They work together. It's much easier this way. People like to roll up. And not roll down. And that's why it's set up this way. Okay. I took the concept of skill checks. This is my old concept. And I've, I've moved past it because it's a little confusing. I don't know why I made it confusing in my own head. Sometimes that's what we do. But I thought of like if you have a one out of three or have a three out of six, people like to roll down. Three or less. But they actually kind of like, once again, like to roll up. Especially when you start adding numbers to things, it's so much easier 
So I made it a roll up phenomenon. So here you would roll one, two, three to have a pass uh, a check at the zero mark. If you roll it up, basically it's four, five, and six, so four and higher. So people like this. Now what's cool about this chart right here, you can just take out the center pin and, and get rid of the rest of these columns. And that's what I'll show you on this next page. And this is what we're using, especially in our last game. I even have an easy, I moved the normal, I put an easy below it. So this would be a four, so easy would be a three, right? So these would be three, four, five, six, right? Three, four, five, six, which is like a 66% chance. Or, right? And what's strange about this is then you can add your bonuses. Now keep in mind, these are stat skill checks. These are not skills like um, forestry or something like this. These are like, some people like to have stat skill checks. I like them. The characters like them. They like to roll dice. That's the reason why I have them. Some people take them out. There's like an argument, do you even need them and all that sort of stuff. That's not the purpose behind this discussion. The discussion is how could you incorporate it with a, a D6? It makes it a little more fun. And here, let's say, in this case, in white box, you don't really get a plus two. But if you had an 18, I would give it a plus two for doing certain things. Uh, because it is the highest thing you could possibly take. You, you're just that much better. Let's say it's 13 or higher or 15 or higher. And if you say, well, if it's an 18, it's a plus two. And this depends on the game master. What, what do you feel comfortable doing? Like I said, the cool thing about this, we just played this last night. You can see my other video, which is going to be put out today. Um, when we played White Star, we used this method and it seemed to move very smoothly. I kind of like it because it's an easy chart. You roll six-sided dice, you add this number, do you beat the target? Oh, it's going to be very hard to hack, right? A security computer. Well, I got a plus three on my tech. Okay, well, you have to hit a six, right? I think actually their scores were a little higher, like seven. So you have to roll four and above. Made it really easy in play. The thing is, when you're playing, you're talking about immersion. You're talking about doing math. You want to make it super easy, and they just kind of roll, and they get the numbers they want. That's the kind of way you should play it, right? Now, this is cool. I really thought about this. It can be a sliding scale. It doesn't have to be just all or nothing. Okay, so if you're using the 1D6, it's, it's, it's not just, it doesn't really have to be feast or famine. You can resolve it by having a sliding scale. So Arthur and Longbow uses his forestry skill, which gives him a four out of six. So if you roll a three, four, five, or six, right? That's a 66% a chance of success. So let's say he has to roll a three and of, but he rolls a two when tracking. I would still give him clues, even though he rolled a two. It's kind of a fail, but not give the obvious answer. Well, you see some twigs broken over here and some twigs broken over there. And then maybe he can ask questions and try to say, well, are there more twigs bro broken on this side? Is there more of this on this side? So that gets the role playing moving a little better. This is where they do the investigation a little better. And they interact with the DM and the scenario a whole lot more. This is just something you want to keep in mind. So you want to pull them into the game more. So if they just say, oh, I just failed. Well, no, you get a little bit. You got close. So let's figure out what you got. And I like to have them roll all their skill checks. Like old school is you roll behind a screen. Don't let them see it. I like let them roll it. Oh, forget it. I don't see anything. Oh, my God, I rolled a one. I'm supposed to roll a five. I don't see anything. I mean, they can know right away. But if they rolled it close, I'm going to give them a little bit. And then they start picking at it to figure out what's going on. So let's say if he's, he's checking for traps, and the odds is one out of six, so he has to roll a six to find the traps, because he's not a thief, right? That's a thief skill, right? He rolls a five. I would not, uh, he doesn't see any obvious trap, but I just wouldn't say there's no traps. I would say there still seems to be a possibility for a net trap up the corridor ahead, because there's a way it's all cleared up, to give them enough to kind of like keep thinking about it. But I just wouldn't say, oh, you discovered a net trap. You even find the mechanism by which it works and you can set it off ahead of time. So this is something to think about. As a, as a dungeon master, you want enough that you pull your people into trying to, you say, oh, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing they can work with. But if you say, well, there's something, you yeah, there might be something up ahead. You can't really tell. Makes them explore their surroundings more. And that's kind of what you're doing, right? And of course, <clears throat> there may be no trap up ahead at all, but it makes them <laughs> think there is. <laughs> and, and that's the tormenting aspect of what we're doing, right? So, this is what it used to be, okay? Roll high when you attack, you're saving through damage and party initiative. And then you roll low for skill checks, thieves, and secret passage and detection. Now, this is my old method. Now, using the roll-up method, it's so much better. Everybody's rolling high. You always roll high. People want to roll high. High is better. So, once again... It's, it just makes it so much easier for when you're in the gameplay. You don't have to say, no, that's a roll low aspect. You just It's always, they get excited when they roll the six or they roll the 20. That's how you play it, right? 
I do have to admit that sometimes I just fall back to the roll of 1d20 and you have to roll under your stat. Uh, the cool thing about that, it's a, it's a little more granular. It's swingy, but granular in the sense that you get these uh, more chances for things to happen. You know, they got, so they have a, a stat of 15, you know what I'm saying? There's a 50%, actually no, 70% chance of them. If you have to roll under 15, uh, that gives them like a 30% chance of them failing in a way, right? So this it's sort of like a weird way of doing it. But then again, it's rolling down, so it really does mess with them a little bit. They just don't like it. So, eh, and then you have to add things or subtract things to it, a plus four, minus four, whatever it is, a plus five, minus five. It becomes too, how would you say, uh, based on their thing. I mean, it's easier when you think about it. If I go back up to this, it's easier to say that's an easy and you do this. I don't have to add a plus four, minus four. So you always think of simplicity. Simplicity. Now I'm playing with kids, right? Um, and we play um, white lies, and we use two d six method. I might use this method if it's seems really really easy for kids to figure out what's going on. And yeah, I might try it next time. See what they see what they think. So when you do a conversion, a basic fantasy role playing game, and you want to put it in white box, it's very easy. Okay. Every time they use hit dice, they say D8, use a D6. <laughs> it's very simple. Easy conversion. All right? The second thing is when you damage, if it's 1D4 or 1D6, you just do 2D6 and take the smaller. If it's 1D8, use 1D6. And if it's anything bigger than 1D8, you take 2D6 and take the larger. And this is for the monsters, obviously, that they're in the book, right? Bows still make two attacks if they were with orcs and goblins. So what I do is if you have to make multiple attacks, like three or more, uh, I just use a, a 3d6 and take the top two dice for the attack. So they just make one attack. Or I mean, you can split up all the hit points to everybody's being attacked if you want. Oh, this this thing has a three-headed snake monster that's going to bite everybody at once. Well, you roll, you can roll 3d6, take the top two dice, and you can split the hit points. There's ways you can do it that actually fit because white box is so much of a, a lower number game when it comes to hit points and damage. Okay. And that's just something to, to keep in mind. All the monsters are going to use the saving throws that you see right here um, with the fighter class and white box, which makes it kind of easy too. So I I like white box, probably one of my favorite games. Obviously, white box, white star, white lies, and now Eldritch Tales, I'm playing that one, just because it's using a d20 and a d6 for all its mechanics. Makes it really easy for us. You know, we're just like... We're not hardcore gamers. We make me game every other week, you know, on the weekends, and we don't like want to think about the mechanics as much as into the story and into the game. So I know some people, if you're younger, and this is what you really like, you're really, really into all these different aspects, but we're not. We're old, and we just want to have fun. So that's kind of where we are. So this is this is the take home. Okay, so if you go to this web page, just kind of letting you know, if you want to get to the money, just hit this thing up here at the top, and boom, it'll take you to the one on the bottom, all blown up for you to, to use for doing this thing, okay? So once again, thank you for listening, and I hope that this doesn't have all that skippy stuff like the other one did. And like I said, I updated it to kind of make it a little more uh, compatible with what I'm doing right now in the game because in playing the game, you have to really read your players. I, I guess they can get used to anything, but because of the sporadicness by which we get to play, sometimes it's just once a month, having to reteach the rules and everything that's going on, you try to find them the easiest way to get them through something and enjoy themselves, okay? With that, have an excellent day. Happy New Year, and thank you for listening.